Good evening. Sorry for the delay. Thank you all for joining us for our first District 67 Joint APT collaboration for this school year. For those of you new to the district or the APT, welcome. My name is Ann Kiesling and I am the current APT president at Cherokee Elementary. Other APT presidents joining me tonight are fearless leader slash executive APT president Megan Engelberg, DPM president Monica Yan, and Sheridan president Heidi Clifton. Last year, our APT leadership came together and devised a plan to provide access for all parents to appropriate, timely, and meaningful topics through various presentations. Prior to last year, events similar to this were held during APT meetings where administrators often duplicated efforts in multiple schools to share information to a limited audience. In a year where we Excuse me, <clears throat> in a year where we were physically separated, these presentations brought open discussion and sharing to our community. We purposefully decided to continue these joint meetings as they were a highlight of last year. Last spring and summer, when planning for the upcoming year, we shared common themes among parent and community discussions. We worked with district leadership to compile the topic for tonight based on these conversations. Tonight, we will cover teaching and learning in the 21-22 school year for District 67. We are so fortunate tonight to be joined by Dr. Jeff McHugh, District 67 Director of Teaching and Learning, Dr. Michelle Shin, Director of School Improvement, Mr. Sam Paulson, Associate Principal of Deer Path Middle School, and Dr. Chad Prozen, Principal of Cherokee Elementary. Tonight's discussion will begin with Dr. McHugh and will progress through our other speakers, each touch touching a different piece of teaching and learning this year. Afterward, we will move to the questions that were submitted by our community. We have a few to start with, but feel free to add more to our form using the link in our chat. I do want to mention as we get started, there were a few questions submitted about building processes related to the pandemic. In the interest of time and staying on topic, we will not be discussing these questions, but please know that we have forwarded them onto the appropriate individuals. Please reach out to your building principal to discuss if you desire. Without further delay, I will now turn it over to Megan Engelberg. Thank you, Anne, and good, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We would also like to thank Mr. Paulson for joining us, and we would like to address the news that came out a few minutes ago about Mr. Tom Harrion, um, Mr. Tom Harrion's recommendation for the Mannheim Middle School Principalship. First and foremost, Mr. Harrion will be missed by our District 67 community, but we are thrilled for him that he will have the opportunity to return to his hometown and be the principal at the middle school that he attended growing up. We also look forward to working with him for the rest of the school year and continuing to return to all in traditional programming. While naturally I know there might be some questions about the future of leadership at DPM, this is very new news and more details will be coming in the near future from the district. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Jeff McHugh. Thank you, Megan. And I also want to say a big thanks to um, Ed and our Intrepid Technology Department who jumped in when they realized that we didn't have sound. Um, for those of you who started off and realized that, thanks for hanging with us. And I do want to say I gave my full presentation already, and I think I used all my A material. So what you're getting now is the B-roll, but what you missed was really great. So thank you for, for bearing with us. So Dr. Shin, if you wouldn't mind uh, teeing up the presentation. For those of you that received the message about tonight, 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 tonight. This presentation just keeps getting better. This is great. Um, can we try that one more time, Dr. Shin? My sound is going in and out, so sorry. But Could, I'm, would I'm, you mind muting Dr. Shin and and presenting again? That had a nice beat to it. it sounded great. All right, so there was our. I like I like that first slide about. Please stand by. That's great. That's a throwback to the '80s. For those of you parents out there that remember the '80s, hopefully that brings back some memories. Okay, Dr. Shin, can we move on to slide three? The form, thank you. For those of you that have questions, some of you already submitted them on the form that was linked into the constant contact about tonight. This is the this is the address, the URL for that form. 
We will also be taking questions throughout the presentation. So if you would like to submit questions as they come up, please do so using this web address. We'll display it again at the end, but if you wanna put it into your computer or your phone or your tablet right now, when you have a, a burning question, please go ahead and enter that and we will field as many of those in the Q&A portion of the presentation as we can. Okay, so moving on, so preparing for the year. Coming into this school year, we were coming off the single most unusual school year and really the single most unusual year of I think any of our lives. And I, I think as a, as a district, we were wondering, what do we need to do to prepare to be all in every day? One of the first steps that we took was to really expand summer school into a much, much more robust program than we had ever had before. In the past, summer school was focused on extended school year for students who had IEPs. And then also there was brainstormers enrichment classes, typically in August, that were enrichment, but we had a good enrollment, but what we realized we needed is a, a summer school program that would allow students to come in and have reinforcement on possibly some learning gaps and unfinished learning from the prior year. So we offered two full summer school sessions in June and in August under the, the guidance of Megan Eigenrau, who was our principal. And it was a big success. And I think it's something as we look ahead to next summer to see if some of that could carry over. We're not sure exactly what that might look like, but we got a lot of positive reviews from parents. And um, just seeing the great teaching and learning that was going on in classrooms um, really made me feel good that we expanded our summer school program when many surrounding districts were actually going the other way. They were making it even smaller because they were having trouble finding teachers. So it was a, a, a great lift by our staff to step up and, and do that for our community. And we, um, we feel like that was a nice step to, to getting back all in every day. While students were in school, teachers were in school too. So every year we offer summer work, which is summer curriculum writing or some work from teams where teachers come in and make adjustments to the curriculum, principals and associate principals come in with their teams and work with them. We have never had a summer that there was as much robust work as this past summer. Um, the school-based teams we're focused on how do we how do we welcome students back in a way that um, some students were out of school for a year and a half. Each school has a spirit committee, so those teams met over the summer to figure out some creative ways to bring back um, students every day. Foundations committees really focus on behavior systems and support, so those teams met over the summer. Um, the Department of Student Services met in order to see how are we going to support students with IEPs and meet their needs coming back. And then we did a lot of um, curriculum writing this summer, a lot of adjustments that were being made. And I know there, there were some questions early on that we'll, um, we'll feel later on in the presentation, but even about grammar and writing, what are we doing for that? We had a lot of teams of teachers that worked over the summer, gave up their time and, and energy to create different units, revise the curriculum, and think about what adjustments do we need to make for the fall of this year, knowing that our, our minutes were reduced last year. We were in school half the amount of time. So there was a lot of work being done by teachers and by teams over the course of the summer. Starting the year, we also looked at staffing supports. And at Deer Path, the deans of culture, Rob Wegley and Ben Niedich, who's our, our new dean of culture there, did a lot of work around behavior supports and SEL. What can they do to support teachers and students in those departments? We added an advanced learning specialist at the middle school. So Laura Paul was there last year. We also have Mary Courtney, who's a former ELA teacher, um, who's supporting students um, in, in advanced learning. And then we have building coaches for the first time at Deer Pass, Cecilia Ryan and Annie Steinbach, who are there to support teachers as well. Um, other supports executive functioning. Um, Cecilia Ryan was our executive functioning teacher at the middle school, and now Marissa Catanese has moved into that role. And we're continuing to look at that program. In fact, um, Sam and I just met this week with, it, with our team to talk through what are we doing to support not just students who um, have really targeted needs with executive functioning, but really all of our students, um, grades five, eight, and thinking about how can we roll this down to the elementary, executive functioning was an area of need before the pandemic, and we're seeing an even greater need for that now. So we're continuing to, to try to figure out ways, how can we reach the most number of students with this to help them with executive functioning skills? And for those of you who are unfamiliar with that term, that's sort of the, uh, the manager of your brain 
responsible for organization and note taking and doing tasks in order. Um, an important skill for all of us, but especially for students coming off of the pandemic. And then finally, social emotional learning. Now, th this is something that District 67 was highlighting pre-pandemic as an area we wanted to focus on. During the pandemic, we know that there were some mixed reviews from students, from staff, and from parents alike as we were trying to figure out what does SEL look like during the pandemic. We've rebooted. We heard stakeholder feedback from, from teachers, from students, and from parents that it was a lot last year, and we're not sure we were getting the most bang for the buck. So we are um, recalibrating what that looks like. We're peeling back so that there's there's fewer lessons, but we're trying to be more explicit in what that, what that instruction looks like. And our team is trying to partner with teachers to make sure that it resonates with what they see the needs are in the classroom. And at the elementary level, we're, we're, we made it an explicit part of the schedule this year because we did see that last year, I think in the elementary, that was much needed. Previously, we did not have set time in the schedule for SEL, whereas this year now across the board K-4, we do have that time. Assessment is also a huge piece of going into the year, and Dr. Michelle Shin is going to tell us everything we need to know about that. I will give it my best, Jeff. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. I think one of the biggest questions, or actually two questions that we get pretty consistently, and I think they were part of the questions tonight, is what kind of unfinished learning do we have with our kids? How did we determine what to do at the beginning of the year? And then what are we doing to support students' social emotional needs as they come back in, either having not been in school um, in person or just the differences in our models from last year? So I can share what we did this fall. I think um, one of the other challenges we have, although last year we were able to collect a year full of assessment data, we weren't able to do that the prior year. So looking at longitudinal information and historical information to try to determine things was a little trickier, but I'll, I'll share with you what we did use this fall and how we've used it for instructional planning. And that process continues throughout our buildings um, all year long. So one of the first things was to identify unfinished learning for all of our students so that we could both evaluate the effectiveness of core instruction and make adjustments for whole groups of students and small groups of students. So in, in typical years, because of the data we collect and we don't have a lot of turnover with our student population, we know a lot about our students in the spring and we front load a lot of our planning and supports for kids in the spring going into the fall so that kids don't miss a beat coming in for the school year. We spend time planning for core instruction all the way down for students with IEPs and staffing. And because that was a little um, interrupted for, for folks and teachers were, had a lot of new faces, we had kids coming back in in person that were in ABA, we really took the focus that we needed to look across large groups of students or classrooms to identify skills or, or areas that a lot of our kids had gaps in. So we started with the whole and kind of worked down into more smaller groups of students that had more specific needs. So the data that we collect, we do this every year, but we did universal screening, which is a process of taking some basic skill uh, measurements and primarily at our elementary levels, some at our middle school with math, to kind of get take inventory of student skills. Where do we see growth? Where do we see areas that are um, of need? Where are areas that are typically not um, high need, but they came in this year? And especially I think from an elementary level, you know, students learning to read is a pretty important area. And we wanted to make sure that we were providing those foundational skills for kids. Again, also our students transitioning from fourth to fifth grade. What does that look like to go into deer path? So we assess early reading and early math skills in our kindergarten and first grade students. We assess reading and math in grades two through four. And then we did uh, some math computation for students in grades five through eight. And then we also use from the fast bridge learning assessments, a social academic and emotional behavior risk scale that we administered K through eight. So while we were looking at both our academic side uh, for students, we also wanted to get input from our students and from our teachers from the social emotional learning side. So those data were all collected pretty early on in the school year. Um, I would say within the first couple of weeks, we had finished with most of our assessment and teams were starting to meet to look at needs across whole groups and targeted intervention. So a majority of our teacher's time has really been spent on once we identified those skill areas, really a diagnostic, uh, digging in diagnostically to instructionally plan for our students. And that includes um, guided reading levels. It includes um, further 
assessment in math with the Boulder Valley Math Assessment. And we use our unit pre and post tests within our ELA curriculum as well as our math curriculum to identify growth with students. And, and teams are meeting, I would say, um, our general ed teachers on average are meeting about once a week to talk about either academic support or behavior support. So we've tried to up the opportunities for our grade level teams to have discussions on an ongoing basis about groups of kids and keep a, a good pulse on our students who might need additional support. So beyond our universal screening, we also have our teams that meet regularly, our intervention planning teams to problem solve for students that may not be making adequate progress in our core curriculum and have needs in social emotional learning that require more targeted or individual responses. And then we use frequent progress monitoring, both at the classroom level, the grade level, and the school level to inform instructional decision making and make any changes early on so that we have students that are not going too long without um, making a course correction for them. I do want to add to we have coming up after Thanksgiving, it's whether it's fall or not, I guess it's officially fall because December or winter hasn't started, but we will start our map testing. We moved that window. We, we prior to the pandemic, I don't know if folks would remember, we used to assess in the fall and we changed that the year that we went into the pandemic. So um, once we get our fall data for map grades two through eight, we will also have a longitudinal picture of what our students look like from a winter to winter, winter pandemic into winter. Um, if you want to say non-pandemic, I don't know if I would go that far, but um, we did have some limitations last year in our data collection just because we had kids home sometimes, we had kids in person, we had kids that didn't take tests. So our data from last year are really for informational purposes and we're definitely relying on the assessment data that we have right now with our kids in person with our teachers so um go forward so really our ongoing data review i think i mentioned this previously is our grade level teams are really looking at com looking at common skill deficits for all students so that we can target those at the grade level rather than small individual groups especially you know for some of our students who may need additional work in in phonemic awareness or decoding or those early literacy skills, we, we've we noticed that in some cases it, it's more kids than we typically have. So we're targeting those at the grade level rather than um, moving into smaller groups like might be more typical in previous years. And then we have intervention planning teams that are working. The intervention planning teams are a combination of our grade level teams who our teachers are meeting regularly and about once a month. Um, we have specialists, so school psychologists, social workers, our reading and math specialists, um, sometimes our coaches will join and they broaden this intervention team to review progress monitoring data for kids, talk about any areas of concern to make changes and adjust their um, groups and recommendations and instructional supports based on the needs of the kids at the various grade levels. That um, there will be an assessment update in December with the um, at the board meeting that will cover um, more of the data that we actually that we do have and give a little bit broader snapshot of how we started the school out this year compared to uh, last year and some pre pandemic information. I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised. I don't know, Jeff, how, if you want to weigh in with this um, in, you know, a lot of questions about learning loss we do see in some grades that we have some time to make up, but overall very pleased at how our students re-entered the school year and have quickly been able to get back into routines and um, all things that I think we can solve. It's just, uh, you know, maybe a couple of months behind, but our students have worked really hard and our teachers have worked really hard to target and ensure that all of our students are catching up. All right, I think, am I going to Dr. Prozen next? You are, before you do, Michelle, because you, you gave me the opportunity to weigh in. I am going to weigh in a little bit on that. Um, that was a little spoiler alert for the assessment report that Dr. Shin will be presenting in December, which will be exhilarating, I'm sure. The, the two main points I want to highlight of what you said, though, Michelle, are so overall, our kids are doing well. When we look at how we did pre-pandemic, when we look at just overall compared to other districts, our kids are doing well. However, everything isn't completely rosy we realize there's unfinished learning, we realize there are learning gaps. So this isn't to say that our teachers and our administrators aren't seeing gaps in students, we absolutely are. I think from the data we're seeing those, those gaps aren't nearly as big as what they thought we would be. 
and we're addressing those on an individual level about what students see as opposed to, wow, we have an entire grade that's six months behind. We're just not seeing that. So Michelle, did I capture that correctly? Absolutely. Okay. We just, we don't want to paint the picture that everything is perfect and rosy, but at the same time, overall things are well. We know there are things to work on, but they're much more manageable than, um, than they are in some other places. All right. So we have Dr. Prozen and Mr. Paulson are going to talk about um, what's what this looks like at each of our levels with elementary and middle school. So I believe I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Prozen. Thank you, Dr. Shin, um, if we could advance there. Uh, and thank you, Dr. McHugh, for uh, kind of leading me into that uh, next piece, because um, one of the terminologies that Lucy Calkins uses uh, throughout her work when you're working um, either with adults in a reflective manner or you're working with students in a reflective manner, the term that um, she utilizes is uh, gems, where your or those celebrations, uh, and then where are those opportunities um, to improve um, and, and grow. So uh, that's what we wanted to kind of delve into here with our uh, K-4 highlights and some of the things that we are sealing, um, seeing uh, as we um, have transitioned now to all in every day. Um, one of the things, and uh, Dr. Shin, thank you very much for talking about the change in the MTSS process, the multi-tiered system of support, which really is both looking at the academic side, but also the behavioral side. So it's kind of under one umbrella. Um, and we've changed that process to really have more conversations, more touch points, uh, more monitoring, and more opportunities for students uh, to receive interventions and to um, accelerate where um, they me might need a little bit more support. And really focusing um, on that tiered approach uh, at the elementary level of what we can do inside the classroom um, immediately right here and now, uh, and then what requires those additional levels of support and allowing students to get access to that um, previously in the elementary level, that system was set up where we were looking at kind of uh, three major data days where um, data really is a, a key driver in this. And it's both uh, the, the quantitative data, but also the qualitative data that we're gathering from teachers and, and um, what they're seeing in the classrooms and allowing that to be a part of the discussion as well. Um, because what it's allowed for, as I said, going to um, three yearly discussions, um, we've moved that to where uh, it's almost monthly now. And uh, teachers are having that opportunity to really reach out. And we've kind of harnessed a team approach uh, so that uh, when we're having these conversations, we have uh, specialists available. Um, in terms of our math specialists and our reading specialists, um, but we also have our behavior specialists in on that. Um, we focused really on the SEL support uh, for uh, our um, students and again, having those conversations take place um, in addition to those data review uh, meetings where um, we're bringing in our school psychologists, we're bringing in the social workers, um, to really support and our teachers have kind of a treasure trove in that area of um, tools that can support them. Um, we have True North and our partnership that is taking place with them uh, as uh, we've done a lot of work in terms of our foundations. Uh, we have access to Lions Quest and Second Step in terms of our curriculum and pulling out individual lessons. And again, um, we're viewing that as um, kind of the, the data that's driving. And so uh, a particular lesson at a grade level uh, may focus around uh, a particular social emotional need that that particular grade level is, um, is kind of seeing surfaced. So um, we're trying to be as individualized and as timely um, on that approach. Uh, I know um, we had uh, this week um, some conversations around uh, just friendship and how you go about making friendships. We had uh, at some of the grade levels um, some uh, really targeted approaches um, to making sure that we are teaching those explicit skills. 
Um, so it's not just saying it's nice to be friends, but we're going deeper in terms of how do you make friends? Um, what does that look like? Why is it important to have friends? Um, and giving kids the terminology uh, that they need in order to create, um, as I said, uh, some problem solving solutions uh, to what they're facing in terms of uh, their kind of social interactions. Um, we've seen increased opportunities for cooperative learning strategies. Um, our teachers have made that instructional shift. Um, while we're maintaining the, the health guidelines and the safety guidelines, um, teaching in person um, and having kids in the classroom and interactions with the classrooms, um, we are providing more of those opportunities where it's just not screen interaction or screen time. Uh, we now have the opportunity, as I said, um, for students to learn that and kind of be immersed in the, the dynamics that go on within an individual in-person classroom. Um, we've seen a return to in-person specials. So again, we want to highlight that holistic view and opportunities of our students uh, where they're receiving um, not just their core, uh, but we know that um, you know, students miss that as well, um, the opportunity to express themselves either in the fine arts uh, or uh, in wellness. Um, we know that our, our students have many uh, different gifts and, and talents as well as interests. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're supporting that whole holistic approach to children. Um, we really focused, as I said, at the K-4 level, the instructional pacing, and that's been driven kind of by our assessment windows uh, to address those, those learning needs. Uh, the data that we got back um, from Sabres, as we said, uh, in terms of the social emotional learning, but also uh, what we got back in terms of FastBridge um, allowed our teachers to really have some meaningful conversations about, you know, this unit at the beginning of the year, might have been a, a two or three week learn um, unit. And um, now maybe um, we spent three to four weeks on that. And we gave our teachers that permission to be able to do that um, based on the needs of uh, what they were seeing in the individual classrooms. Um, our instructional building coaches have been a great support uh, to the instructional delivery as well as to the student learning uh, because when they sit down uh, with our teachers, they're doing it with really job embedded professional learning. Um, they are having conversations with our teachers, um, not only in the planning stages of the lesson or the lesson um, kind of preparation, uh, but they're also going in and watching the lesson delivery, having reflective conversations with our teachers um, that have been most helpful in terms of how we can get uh, the most effective and efficient uh, instructional uh, strategies out to our students. And we've also seen a return to uh, full-time minutes. Uh, as Dr. McHugh had mentioned, um, we've got those opportunities now, the authentic inquiry that's taking place in science and social study um, units where our students are receiving both a combination of push into the classroom as well as pull out um, to be able to really not just um, stay at the um, kind of levels of either Bloom's taxonomy or um, our DOK models in the classroom um, that we're really looking to um, stretch our students thinking and getting them back into a culture of inquiry because we think that that's um, important and they have the, those opportunities. Um, so Dr. Shin, if we could kind of now look at uh, the opportunities um, and, and areas that, you know, we're seeing where we know that um, we can have additional conversations around and are planning and, and having conversations. Um, one of the things that we are finding, and this wasn't a surprise, um, this was a, a big conversation uh, that we were uh, having beginning even in the summer. We knew even those small tasks were going to take longer um, at the K-4 level where you have students that this may be their very first experience in school. Um, and they may be at the second grade level or they may be at the first grade level um, that we needed to really bring about the concept of what school is um, to those students and do it at the developmental um, appropriateness of where they were. Um, they may not be five years old, but they may be seven years old. And we wanted to make sure that they understood 
what it means to be in school and what it means to be in school um, in person. And again, um, that was both in that MTS model with both um, the behavioral expectations as well as the learning foundations. Um, so we really are using the data at the um, K-4 level um, to monitor. We are seeing um, as we are progressing um, into uh, the month of uh, November and December, um, we're seeing those routines become more commonplace. Students are becoming much more, um, this is how school runs. Um, this is the expectation of school. This is the expectation of learning within the classrooms. Uh, we knew that, as I said, usually, you know, by September, uh, end of September, October, um, you're really starting to see that click and gel. Um, took a little bit longer, um, but understandable. And, you know, we are seeing our students kind of get their groove um, in terms of uh, not only those behavior expectations, but also um, their learning expectations and, and teachers um, understanding, okay, um, that explicit skill is so very important uh, at the K-4 level. And with that, um, I believe uh, I will turn it over to Sam uh, to talk about uh, how things are going all in every day at DPM. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prozen. Uh, I'm Sam Paulson. I'm the associate principal on the 7-8 side at Deer Path Middle School. It's a pleasure to join you this evening. Uh, so first of all, we too, of course, are following the philosophy of all in every day. And that's certainly our goal. Uh, and a lot of the stuff I'm going to cover is a very similar uh, content that Chad just covered. So I want to make sure that we, we honor time and allow for questions at the end. So first and foremost, we had to think about student scheduling, which at the middle school is obviously a jigsaw puzzle every single year. And we wanted to make sure we were very reflective about how the hybrid model went, whether a student was in person or participated in the ABA program last year and try and provide as much consistency as humanly possible as kids went back into the deep end of a full load of learning. So we tried to continue those teacher relationships wherever possible. So on the 7-8 side, you might be aware, we always try to loop from the 7th grade to the 8th grade. And then uh, in the five, six side, we wanted to make sure we had those peer relationships as consistent as possible. So we really looked at it proactively to try and set students up with schedules that would be a successful learning environment for them, whether it was their learning style, their, the social dynamics of middle school, which are so important, and just really thinking about all those various components to make sure that this year was as smooth as possible as we transitioned back to full in-person learning. And the full in-person learning came the full instructional model. And again, just as Chad was just mentioning, that means that increased rigor and that increased pacing. Uh, students had half the academic load due to the hybrid model last year, as well as all of their specials classes that would be our creative arts, our wellness and our world language classes. They were all remote. So all of a sudden they had nine periods they had to juggle and that means more frequent homework, more teachers, more expectations. And we really wanted to make sure we were cognizant of that. And uh, first of all, it is a huge celebration that our students get the full load again, but making sure we do it in a thoughtful way. Uh, as Dr. McHugh had mentioned, we have such wonderful resources in District 67 and at Deer Path in particular, we have our deans of culture, our instructional coaches uh, that are our building coaches, as well as the executive functioning support and our advanced learning specialist. And we really used the scheduling piece to proactively place them where they could push into these various class periods and provide that differentiation and support. So there was an extra pair of hands in the room, an extra set of eyes, another way to make sure our students were on track and they had the support that they needed. Uh, as you know, as we are all experiencing the adjustments back to normalcy, we're noticing that some students may have floated under the radar last year. And this is a great opportunity for us to really catch them and make sure they get that intervention and that support that we can provide. Uh, beyond academics, we have, of course, all the wonderful sports clubs and activities that Deer Path has to offer. And we're trying to provide the full slate wherever we can uh, allow students to have that connection back into school and explore those passions that they have, whether it's through our athletics or through our clubs. Um, just uh, today, our esports club was hopping in um, Mr. Polina's STEM room. They were playing games together, having a great time. And that's always wonderful to see. And then finally, uh, of course, there's the other side we want to support, and that's the whole child. So being that social emotional learning, which uh, we heard loud and clear last year, 
We really try to hit it hard uh, with multiple lessons, multiple times a week during homeroom. And it was too much for the kids. Uh, eventually, the, the message started to get tuned out because kids weren't really buying in. So we really strategically prioritized which components of the castle competency, uh, being awareness of self, awareness of others, self-management, that we wanted to prioritize. And the SEL lessons are now taught uh, every week, um, ever, excuse me, every other week, one day per week. So they get it two times a month and then they get two executive functioning lessons per month. So really targeting, we're gonna stop and drop explicitly teach these skills to all kids because they all will benefit from it and using that homeroom time to really prioritize the whole child. And then in regards to school-wide activities, we're trying to really bring that connection to Deer Path and that whole school culture feel back again. So uh, for instance, this month, the month of November, we're calling it our month of gratitude, considering that it is Thanksgiving. And we're using it as an opportunity to really celebrate all the positive contributions that students are making to our school community. So you may have heard your students at Deer Path talk about the little feather icons that are being given to students who really demonstrate our Deer Path core values. Uh, being perseverance, integrity, compassion, curiosity, and of course, being fantastic. And in all of their homerooms, their turkeys are growing with these wonderful feathers that represent the things that they're doing. As of this week, we have given out over 2,000 feathers building wide just in the past couple weeks alone to show how much good is truly happening within our walls every single day. And then we're going to celebrate on Friday uh, thank you to the generosity of the spirit and the APT. We're going to be providing Susie Swirl to all kids to celebrate all the good that's happening at Deer Path. Dr. Shin, if you can go to the next one. And uh, similar to how uh, Dr. Prozen pointed out, there are, of course, opportunities to grow. So with students uh, being primarily isolated during the pandemic, we noticed that a lot of the socialization and those positive interactions uh, students were missing that during this critical time of cognitive development, especially in middle school, where social dynamics are such a large component of their day. So we are seeing a rise in some behavior, and we're trying to address it accordingly. So we need to make sure we're reteaching those expectations. We truly view behavior just like we would another core content area that we teach. It's not something we just expect kids to know. We need to make sure that it is repeated over and over again. And if a student struggles and they're showing this is a deficit area and I need a little more help, that's where our deans of culture step in. And we truly view them as educators themselves. And they work with kids. How do I problem solve this situation? This friend is engaging with me in this way and I'm not sure how to handle it. And they're there to be that positive adult connection in the building that helps students understand how to navigate the sometimes tricky waters that are that is middle school. So we're really focusing on that, both on the intensive side for kids who really need that extra help and also more globally with those SEL lessons. Uh, the deans of culture work with our True North coach um, as well as our district behavior coach to develop those lessons. And as things pop up, whether it's the TikTok challenges uh, that we all keep hearing about, including the one you received a constant contact about today, we want to make sure we are being responsive and we're addressing it immediately to make sure kids know exactly how they need to behave in middle school. And then just really briefly to touch on, of course, there's the modified pacing, as Dr. Prozen had mentioned, making sure that we aren't just throwing kids back in the deep end, but we are tiptoeing into the shallow end and adjusting things accordingly based on the content that may not have been covered during the hybrid model. And then using the opportunity to really refocus our content on those really critical core competencies we want all students to walk away with. So the things they may have missed in the grade prior that we didn't go into the full depth that we would have liked in a typical year, really hitting those hard and emphasizing those at the beginning of this year to ensure our students have that foundational understanding so they can be successful in their current grade. And then finally, again, that data piece is so important. And Dr. Shin talked about all the assessment tools and metrics that we use, whether it's the savers for social emotional learning or all those academic tests that we have and reviewing them on a more consistent basis so we can truly address those areas in a timely fashion and make sure that we give our departments the professional learning that they need so they can be supportive of all kids. Uh, we have opportunities for students to get additional support if they truly need it. We have the Math Resource Center, which is held before school, 
which is now being offered grades five through eight, as well as SOAR. And that is an opportunity after school where we actually have high school tutors come to Deer Path and they serve as that positive peer role model and they help students with academics and staying on track with their work. So again, the theme, we're back all in every day. We're doing all we can to support our kids. And uh, we thank everyone in their partnership this year for making it a success so far. Dr. McHugh, back to you. Thanks, Sam. And thank you, Michelle, for putting up the uh, the bit.ly um, link for those of you that would like to submit questions. Now, we are short on time, and I'm going to propose to the group, could we hang a couple minutes after? I don't want to go too late. We all need our beauty rest. But um, maybe we can go because we started a little bit late, a few minutes later, because there were a lot of really good questions that are coming through, and we want to have a chance to answer those. Um, for Michelle, for Chad, for Sam, and 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 for me, let's maybe try to keep our answers really tight and concise so that we can address as many of them as possible. So think of this as something as as a lightning round, which is one of my um, favorite questioning techniques. So um, APT ladies, I think you're going to facilitate this, right? And and read us some questions. Yes, thank you, Jeff. Um, we are taking the questions that were submitted um, on the Google form and each of the APT presidents will be asking them. So I think Heidi, you were going to start. That's right. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for your presentation and the time. It was it was great and very informational. Um, I've got a couple questions. I know we're going to kind of go off uh, and switch off for the moment. But uh, one of the questions we were asked by a parent is how do you address emotional and learning gaps young kids are having not being able to see other students in teachers' faces, you know, and missing those specific facial cues? Who wants to handle that one? I know it's very specific. I just figured it is an interesting question. Okay. I know a couple of things, and they did this last year too. Many schools have taken pictures of the the staff and the kids without their masks, and present and have them in in places throughout the building so that they can see um, those the differences. So I think there's been more of a concerted effort to try to make that transparent, especially at the elementary school. I also think, and this is just anecdotal, people are getting getting really good at reading smiles and laughter and using eyes, I think, to um, get to emotion. I do think we do have some grade levels and we have different masks available for folks that are working on, students that are working on specific skills where it requires seeing the mouth or needing to have direct instruction. And if we really do need to pull a mask down for something, we socially distance and allow the students and, and the teacher to do what the student needs at that time. So. Um, a lot of variations with that. I don't know, Sam, if there are other things at, at the middle school level. Um, I don't know if the kids want to see everybody's pictures as much as the elementary school. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I would say they get plenty of socialization during lunch in the cafeteria where they are obviously removing their masks to eat as well as at recess. There are opportunities throughout the day where they aren't always covered up. Uh, so there, it's not um, like last year where if they were in the building, it was all masks all the time. Thank you. And I think you had the next question. Perfect. Please explain why the elementary schools will not live stream the full day. Why is DPM able to live stream and the elementary schools are not? I can tackle that one. Um, and it's a good question. This is one of those, we, we speak a lot about tight and loose. What needs to be the baseline that is consistent across the schools, across the district? And what are things where there's some autonomy? And um, as a team, um, we, we met and we talked to teachers and we decided that at the baseline last year, we didn't do any live streaming really, or at least not systematically. And we realized that for this year with quarantines, we wanted to make that an option. At the same time, one of the big concerns is having teachers teaching what's called concurrently, where you're teaching students online while at the same time you're teaching in person. It's a huge lift on teachers that really does impact the instruction of in person. So what we decided is our tight was that we were going to offer live streaming for students who are quarantining for the direct instruction portion of a lesson. So it was a window into the classroom was the phrase that we're using so that students who are at home could hear some of that direct instruction. And that way they weren't completely missing out on that. Now, however, the loose part of it is in some, in, in some subjects and in some, in some areas, 
teachers do have the capacity to do more than that, where it isn't impacting instruction for the other students in their class. I think at the middle school, um, just the structure of teaching middle school, the independence of the kids, it might be a little bit more feasible than when you're doing it in a kindergarten classroom, where there's not a lot of direct instruction and a lot of smaller group work there. So we try to make the tight, the, the window into the classroom that's still connecting kids while they're quarantining, but the loose was making it so that teachers and subject areas could make sure that they're also still providing a robust education to the kids that are in the room while still connecting those kids who are quarantined. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Monica. Yeah, uh, I know, Jeff, you touched on executive functioning, and that's what my question is related to. It is how are middle school students being taught study skills and executive functioning systems like organization and time management and using a planner? Well, just to reiterate uh, the, the message so far, we have those two explicit executive functioning lessons per month that all students get in their homerooms. And it, we have a full scope and sequence of the various skills we want all students to master. Um, as we always say in middle school, you're not just learning the content of school, you're also learning how to go to school very much still. And building these study skills for all kids is hypercritical, especially at this time as we're preparing them for that large transition to high school. For students who struggle a little more than others, uh, Ms. Katniss is able to provide the more intensive instruction, whether it's through our Enriched Studies class, which is a full class that really targets those skills, or just doing check-ins during homeroom. And we have entrance criteria for that. So if a parent is interested in getting their kid a little more help, I'd say reach out to your student's homeroom teacher and we can explore that entrance criteria and if that student would be a good candidate for that level of need. Thank you, Sam. Um, I have the next question. Um, our reading and writing curriculum doesn't seem to prioritize grammar and spelling. Does the district have plans to fill these learning gaps for our elementary and middle school age students? Yeah, I'm going to really try to hold myself to the lightning round um, answer to this. I think I could speak all day on this. Um, I think our teachers, I think our admin team, I think our parents and our students would agree that our current writing curriculum I just gave you the best answer right there and nobody heard it. That's that's a shame. Uh, like I said, this is the B-roll, people. Um, it's going to be hard for me to keep this tight because we've been doing engaged in this work for years now, um, realizing that grammar, conventions, spelling weren't one of the strengths of our current writing curriculum. Teachers saw this. Parents, I know you saw this. Our admin team saw this. So we've done a lot of work to supplement. In fact, over the summer, we had teachers getting together that put together grammar micro units and boot camps to be doing before units and during units, knowing that we need to supplement with some uh, explicit instruction. This showed up on our test scores and it shows up just in, in the student's writing. So yes, we recognize that it's an issue. We're working on it in terms of working with teachers on building units. K-4, we did over the summer, and we're working now with 5-8 because we realize now that um, we need to do that at the middle school as well. But it's working with the teachers to make sure that it fits in to what they're doing with, with the kids. I could talk all day on this, but I'm just going to mute myself again. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Heidi, you are up. Yes. Uh, what supports are available for elementary children in District 67? that need academic help due to learning gaps. For example, other local schools are offering after school programming to address these concerns. Is this something we would do at the district? Michelle, I'm looking at you. I thought so. It's, it's like, so I think one of the things that we're very fortunate um, even during the pandemic and coming into this year is we have a lot of resources. So I think people should know at our building levels, we have full-time reading, full-time math specialists in uh, across the board. We have advanced learning specialists two um, in each building. So we have the capacity to, we also have co-teaching and have upped all of our inclusive practices models. So in, on, in most days in your child's classroom, you're lucky if you have fewer than two people. And some days there are three or four adults that might be working in a classroom based on the needs of the kids. So we try, we know our, our day is very rigorous for our kids and knowing 
stamina and getting through a full day has also been kind of a common theme that we've heard just, you know, kids aren't switching off after an hour and going to take a break. It's that, that routine. So we have done as best we can to identify where those needs are and use the specialists that we have throughout the school day in order to provide those supports and also ensure that when kids leave school, that they also have a, we also recognize that there's a life after school and having those social connections and time. I do, my time is very tight at night with trying to feed my kids and get to an activity. And we are trying to keep that balance, um, not opposed to offering those things. But I, I think parents should know that we're providing a ton of support throughout the school day, knowing that there's only so much that kids can take in doing it at that time and then allowing them to disconnect a little bit outside of school, especially the younger kids. Um, the older kids are ramping up for high school, so that might look a little different, but trying to be developmentally appropriate as well as responsive to the needs of the kids with a lot of staff that are um, spread out throughout our classrooms. And again, at the middle school, just a plug for the Math Resource Center and our SOAR program, which happen outside the school day for additional support if students are interested. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, Anne. The mute. How is bullying being addressed at DPM and at the elementary schools? By that, the questioner means repetitive, targeted behavior with ill intent. What are the consequences and how is this handled when repeated? Uh, so at the middle school, we have what we call the behavior matrix. And the behavior matrix is broken down into a, num a number of levels and each type of behavior falls into one of those categories. And as a student displays a behavior, there's a certain response. And our deans of culture, again, like I said, we really view it as another content area that needs to be taught, and especially when we have all of these students that haven't had these typical social interactions for so long. Many of our kids are receiving so much of these behavior lessons through their phones. They're seeing it on social media and to them, it's not even ringing true necessarily that this is an unexpected behavior of a student their age or for people in general. So we're really having to counter program a lot of that and teach a lot of these things explicitly. So whether it's through our kindness campaign that I talked about, whether it's through the social emotional lessons that all kids are getting, that's how we're teaching how students at Deer Path, but really just people in general should be interacting with each other. Now, if we see a repeated behavior, obviously we intervene immediately and we want to make sure that that behavior stops. Every child deserves a learning environment where they could focus on school and not worry about something like that. So the deans will work with that student, have that reteaching experience, and it'll start small. It might be a check-in, establishing, are you aware of what's occurring? Uh, we always provide the opportunity for what we call restorative justice or restorative practices. If a student does harm, just like we make mistakes as adults, we wanna give them the opportunity to make it right. It's okay to make mistakes as long as you learn from it and change your behavior. So they'll have that restorative circle with that student. That student will have a chance to express if they're comfortable, how that action made them feel so we can build that empathy and that awareness of others. But truly, if that behavior continues, that tells us as adults, more reteaching is needed. So that means longer time. That means this is such a priority. We might have to take time outside of lunch, outside of class, and really focus on how this student must behave in order to re-enter the learning environment and be a contributing member of Deer Path again. So it's something we take incredibly seriously and we have our online incident report if a student is experiencing any form of bullying and they're a little worried about um, being perceived as saying something, they can submit something anonymously. Our door is always open as administrators. We always tell kids we can't solve a problem unless we know about it. So please reach out and let us know immediately. The sooner we know, the more we can do. Thank you. Chad? And at the elementary level, um, very similar uh, approach to what Sam um, had, had mentioned. Uh, one of the things that we want to make sure that every student at the elementary level uh, has is a trusted adult. Um, and sometimes uh, that is the homeroom teacher and sometimes is, uh, has been reiterated here tonight, we have a lot of support. Um, and sometimes kids will make connections. Um, if they're musically inclined, that might be the music teacher, that may be the band teacher. 
um, so that they know um, that the adults are here to support them. Um, that's the number one key. Um, and then, as Sam mentioned, um, in terms of getting that reporting system uh, with the elementary level um, students, again, uh, Sometimes as we get with our intermediate students, um, again, we want that kind of reporting system um, that's anonymous and we work with them um, in cases where that may be a star at the top of their paper um, and nobody knows um, except the teacher, oh, this person needs to, to have a conversation with an adult and we try to make sure that, as I said, that's um, taken uh, in a, a, a private and confidential manner with them. Um, and then once we have that um, information, again, um, we're really talking about the explicit skills. And at the elementary level, we're having a lot of conversations around empathy. Um, what do words mean? Um, and what do my actions mean? And um, how that not only is, um, you know, in, in um, being portrayed in my character, but how are other people um, feeling as a result of that? So again, it's the explicit skills uh, that we are teaching and, and working with our students on. Um, again, recognizing um, that some of our students, that this is their first school experience that they may be having in an in-person setting. Um, and really, as I said, working with them um, to understand their behaviors and how their behaviors impact others. So um, again, with the, the reporting system, the explicitness uh, of the, the teaching, um, and then again, bringing in those restorative practices so that um, students can kind of understand and work through um, these situations. Thank you. Megan, um, in, just in terms of time, um, I don't know how many more questions are on the form to be submitted, but maybe one or two more. How does that sound? We have two more. And oh, right. All right, Monica, I think you had the next one. Yes. So what is the role of the Illinois State Board of Education in our district? How much influence does ISBE have on our curriculum? And how does the district go about selecting the grade level curriculum? And where can I find information on this? So this is a four parter. <laughs> Four-parter, <laughs> and we're trying to do a lightning round. All right, I'm gonna, team, do you mind if I handle this one? This is totally my wheelhouse. Um, first off, ISBE going to the website has all of the information right there in terms of what is mandated and what is not. A surprising amount is not mandated. So much of curriculum is under local control. There are certain units that are mandated, and there are certain requirements, but a lot of it is under local control. So if you go to the ISBE website, if you click under, if you if you search um, mandated units, it'll bring up a whole a whole list on there that you can see what is mandated and what is not. In terms of what we use to select materials, um, it's we have curriculum review cycles. Right now, we're in one for reading K eight, and then for math um, six eight. We work with teachers. We work with as an administrative team. We talk to other districts about what they're using and we do extensive research into different materials and then look at what materials would best suit our population and the standards. I'm wondering if this question, I know that there's a lot of hot button topics out there right now and a lot of a lot of viewpoints about curriculum and what's being taught in school. So if, if that's kind of where this question was is going, I would recommend having the conversation with somebody at the, either the building administrative level or me. Call me, have a conversation with me. Um, because I think there's also a lot of misunderstandings and people who are concerned about things that some people are concerned there's things that are mandated to be taught in our schools that it's absolutely not true, that's not happening. Um, so I would encourage you to reach out if you have concerns to whether it's one of our principals or you can always reach out to me. I'd be happy to have dialogue with, with anybody about that. I will wrap this four-part question by saying if you go on our district website under, I believe it's under curriculum, it lists what we're using and some of the topics in each of those. But again, if you want a deeper dive into that, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Thank you. And the final question, how many hours are spent on core curriculum per week and how many hours are spent on SEL per week? Uh, you'll have to help me with the math, but we're back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, so we have core classes, and those are our four cores of the middle school. So that's English, language, arts, social studies, math, and science. They are all 53 minutes. So 53 times four times five, that's our um, amount of hours or uh, 
for the core curriculum. And then again, for our SEL instruction, uh, we have that in tandem with our executive functioning lessons. And that's one 40 minute homeroom period per week. So 40 minutes. So again, that huge emphasis back on the core curriculum at the middle school. Chad, from the elementary level, I don't know that we need to break down all of the minutes, but it's 45 minutes a week for SEL at the elementary level, but not necessarily all in one chunk, right? Correct. Um, teachers have flexibility if they want to um, break that into, you know, 20 and a 15 minute lesson. Um, that's kind of the um, minimum. It's 8.13, and I'm pretty sure the sound came back on at 7.13. I think we were almost exactly 60 minutes by the time that we we worked that out. So APT, anything else before we wrap this? Um, there were some specific questions added to the form about um, the fifth grade um, quarantine. So I encourage whoever has that question um, to please reach out um, to the admin at, um, at DPM or to um, Dr. Shin. Um, and uh, there was another one that was a little bit more specific about grammar that we are forward to um, to Mr. Paulson. So if anybody that wants more um, answers on that, if you want to just reach out to the, to Mr. Paulson too, that would be great. Um, and then finally, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Dr. McHugh. Thank you, Dr. Shin. Thank you, Dr. Prozen and Mr. Paulson for joining us tonight for this important update on teaching and learning. We truly appreciate your time um, in putting together this presentation as well as your time tonight. I would also like to thank our building presidents for their input and their participation in the programming this evening. Finally, thank you to our parent community as we head into the holiday season. Please know how grateful our APT board is for all of the parents and parent volunteers that carry out our programming throughout the years. Throughout the year, the last two years have not been easy, and we appreciate your continued willingness to engage and volunteer your time. We wish you all a happy Thanksgiving and a wonderful Thanksgiving break. Thank you so much.